Hello everyone and welcome back to Total Organic Chemistry. This video I'm going to be taking a look at haloalkanes or alkyl halides and also introducing the concept of nucleophilic substitution. So after this video hopefully some of the questions you'll be able to answer are what are some of the properties of haloalkanes? What sorts of reactions do haloalkanes undergo? How do nucleophiles and electrophiles react with each other? And finally, what are some common nucleophiles that we can use in organic chemistry? So as always, please be sure to like and subscribe to my channel if you enjoy this video or learn anything along the way. So let's get started with haloalkanes. Haloalkanes are just like normal alkanes, except they have some sort of carbon-halogen bond. And they are incredibly important in organic chemistry and organic synthesis. So we can imagine drawing some different haloalkanes here all based off of ethane. So we could have fluoroethane, chloroethane, bromoethane, and iodoethane. So just going straight down the list of halogens on the periodic table. We can easily determine the polarity of all of these Cx bonds, where X is some sort of halogen, from the electronegativity of all of the halogens. So we know that fluorine is the most electronegative, and iodine is the least. So we know that the way I've written them here, the polarity decreases. And because of that decreasing polarity, like we saw in one of my previous videos, we know that the bond strength also decreases. So the CF bond is the strongest carbon-halogen bond, and CI is the least. And the relative polarities of these carbon-halogen bonds will be something that will become much more relevant and much more important as we start discussing nucleophilic substitution. We can also maybe figure out that the boiling point will actually increase to the right. So we know that increased dispersion forces result in higher boiling points. So if we have a very large atom, like iodine, it will have more London dispersion forces or van der Waals forces therefore making the iodoethane have the largest boiling point of these four compounds that I've drawn. Whereas fluorine is very small, so it has very few London dispersion forces, which means that fluoroethane will have the lowest boiling point. And another thing to note that might be very intuitive is that haloalkanes will have higher boiling points generally than their alkane counterparts, because that polar carbon-halogen bond creates dipole-dipole interactions, which make those boiling points much higher. So what are some reactions characteristic of haloalkanes? Well, nucleophilic substitution is an extremely important reaction in organic chemistry. It's very ubiquitous, and we're going to be spending quite a lot of time on it. So just as the name sounds, nucleophilic substitution consists of some nucleophile substituting some part of another molecule. And this reaction is important because in haloalkanes, the halogen is going to be the thing that is substituted. So the halogen is going to be kicked off and replaced by the nucleophile. And we'll talk about what those nucleophiles can be in a second. So the mechanism is fairly simple. So we start with our nucleophile, and we can abbreviate that as just nuc with a lone pair and perhaps a negative charge. So remember, nucleophile means nucleus-loving or positive charge-loving. So a lot of nucleophiles will be negatively charged, but not all of them. But they will all have some lone pair that they can donate. So we have our nucleophile, and it will be attacking an electrophile. So nucleophiles and electrophiles react. And in this case, the electrophile will be some haloalkane. So we'll have an R group. Remember, an R group is just any carbon backbone bonded to some halogen X. And that electrophile, because of the polarity of the halogen, will have a partial negative charge on X and a partial positive charge on the carbon substrate. So because of that partial positive charge on the carbon, the nucleophile can go and attack that carbon, kicking off the halogen in the process. So that will produce two products, the first of which is our our nuke, so our haloalkane has had that halogen replaced with the nucleophile, and then we'll also have X minus, so whatever that halogen is, 
now has a lone pair, an extra lone pair, which will make it negatively charged. So an important thing to keep track of is that we've conserved charge on both sides. So we have one negative charge on the left side in our nucleophile and one negative charge on the right side in our halogen. And that's what we call our leaving group because it's left the substrate. Another thing that could happen is just a slight variation where we could have a nucleophile that is neutral. So like I said, not all nucleophiles are negatively charged. So we can write just nuke with a lone pair. So all nucleophiles have some lone pair. And it could attack the same substrate here, our Rx haloalkane, kicking off the halogen, just like we did before, and producing this time, it'll be a slightly different product, so we're gonna have our nuke again, but this time it will be positively charged overall, since our nucleophile was neutral to begin with, instead of negatively charged like in the first reaction. And just like before, we'll have X minus, so our halogen with a negative charge, but this time it's going to form a salt with the R nuke product, because whenever you have two ions in solution like this, we have a positively charged cation and a negatively charged anion, those two things will form a salt. But in the end, we end up with the same two products. So what are some of the most common nucleophiles that can participate in these nucleophilic substitution reactions? Well, let's write a few down here. So we can have OH minus, it's a good nucleophile, it's our hydroxide. We can also have OCH3, or any sort of OR group. So just replacing that hydrogen with some alkyl group. We could also, interestingly, have a halogen, like iodide. So I minus is actually, turns out to be a pretty good nucleophile. We could have CN, so our cyanide group, and the negative charges on that carbon. We could maybe have this SCH3 group, so sulfur is directly below oxygen on the periodic table, so it's going to have very similar properties, and it is also a good nucleophile. And these all have negative charges, but like I said, we can also have neutral nucleophiles. So for example, that could be something like ammonia, NH3. We know that nitrogen has a lone pair in NH3, so it can also act as a nucleophile. And then similarly, a lot of phosphorus compounds. So we could have this phosphorus center with three methyl groups on it. And again, phosphorus is directly below nitrogen on the periodic table, so it will also have very similar reactivity and phosphorus has that lone pair that it can use to act as a nucleophile. And the reactivities of these nucleophiles vary widely. We'll talk about the reactivities of different nucleophiles and how to determine that a little bit later, but for now just know that these are all very common nucleophiles that you can use in nucleophilic substitution reactions. So let's take a look at some more examples of these nucleophilic substitutions. So we could, for example, have uh, methyl chloride, so CH3Cl, and that's our haloalkane. And we could react that with OH-, so that's one of our nucleophiles that we know of. And we know, obviously, that we can't just have pure OH-, that's not a thing that exists. So we have to have some sort of counter ion to balance that out. And usually... That comes in the form of something like NaOH, so sodium hydroxide is what we would use to accomplish this reaction. And what's our product going to be? Well, remember from the mechanism, the halogen will be kicked off and substituted by our nucleophile. So the halogen will come off, and we're going to end up with CH3OH, which is methanol. And something you'll encounter a lot in organic chemistry is that organic chemists don't usually balance their reactions. So in fact, we do have Cl- as a byproduct of this reaction, but we don't usually care about that, so a lot of times we just leave it out. We only care about the main organic product. We could also have another electrophile, so another haloalkane. This time we'll have an iodide, and we could react this with another strong nucleophile, Cn-, so cyanide. And most of the time, again, we need a counter ion, so we supply that in the form of sodium cyanide, is what you would use in the laboratory. And again, very simple, the halogen gets kicked off and is replaced by the CN group. One last one here, we can have our ethyl iodide and react that with ammonia, so NH3. This time it's our neutral nucleophile, 
so it doesn't have a negative charge. And in this case, remember with neutral nucleophiles, what we're going to do is form a salt. So we will, just like as before, have the NH3 substitute the iodide. So we'll have NH3 plus this time, because we need to balance out the charge. And then iodide will be the counter ion in that salt. And instead of determining the products for these reactions, we can also look at a product and try to determine how to synthesize that product using simpler starting materials. So this is called retrosynthetic analysis, sort of doing the synthesis backwards in order to figure out how to synthesize a particular compound. And it's very prevalent throughout all of organic chemistry. So what if we take this compound here, and this is called a thioether, we'll talk a little bit about those later in the course, and it's got this SCH3 group on it. Well, how do we make that? So we know that in these nucleophilic substitution reactions, we need to have a haloalkane first, and then also a nucleophile to react with that haloalkane. So what's our haloalkane? Well, we could actually imagine two different haloalkanes that we could possibly use to synthesize the final product. So we could use an ethyl halide. So it could be ethyl chloride, ethyl bromide, ethyl iodide. It doesn't really matter what the haloalkane is at this moment. We'll learn about a little bit later which ones are better to use in certain situations. And we could also use a methyl halide. So maybe methyl chloride or methyl bromide. And then our nucleophile needs to supply that sulfur atom in some way. So we can look back at our list of common nucleophiles and see that SCH3, or any sort of sulfur compound, is a good nucleophile. And we need to end up with three carbons in the product with an SCH3 group. So there's actually two different ways to do this. We could start with the ethyl halide, so for example ethyl bromide, and react that with SCH3 minus and that'll give us our final product. It will kick off the bromine and replace it with the SCH3. And we could also use the methyl bromide, for example. And instead of using SCH3 as our nucleophile, we could use S with an ethyl group, so SCH2, CH3 minus. And that would give us the exact same product. And both of these sulfur compounds, because they have a minus charge, would, again, be supplied with some sort of sodium salt or potassium salt or something like that to balance out the charge. So we would have maybe NaSCH3. And like I said, either of these methods would work to synthesize this product, and in future videos we'll take a look at which method will be better and what sort of problems you might run into choosing one over the other. So that concludes my discussion on haloalkanes and a little bit of an introduction to nucleophilic substitution. As always, thank you very much for watching, and please be sure to like and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. Also, please consider donating to my Patreon page. It helps me a lot to continue creating content and more videos for you.